Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the session. My name is um, Julia and I'll be chairing the session this morning so I'm the person that will be keeping everybody on time. We have two guest speakers this morning and the first one is Guy Lewis from Anglicare, so thank you Guy. The title of his presentation is Transformation Through Integration and just to formally introduce Guy, Guy is the Service Integration Program Worker for Anglicare in the south of Tasmania. He's been in the role for 18 months after working with various services across the community sector for the past 15 years. Guy comes from a counselling background and is enjoying working with so many passionate and committed people whilst in his current role. And as the um, manager, the Southern Area Manager for Partners in Recovery, um, Guy has been working very closely with Partners in Recovery with quite a few of our support facilitators. And um, from working with him and actually seeing him work in his role, he's also a very passionate and committed person and we're very lucky to have that partnership and relationship with Guy. So I hope you enjoy the session and um, welcome to Guy. Uh, thank you, Julia. Oh, I, um, yeah, that was a was a okay. I managed to switch it off. There's my there's my mistake. Got that out of the way. Um, so yeah, thanks, Julia. That was a lovely uh, introduction. Again. This might, uh, we'll have to see how we go with this. Um, I might not um, stand up all the time. This, and so I might actually sit down for, for part of the presentation if that's okay with you guys. Yep, that's okay with you guys out the back. Um, I guess I just wanted to say thank you all for coming and, and welcome to this uh, transformation through integration um, session. Um, I'm hoping, really hoping that, uh, given that it's the third day of the conference for you guys, and you've probably been working quite hard and eating a lot of food and drinking a lot of wine by the sounds of things, um, or at least Andrew was. Uh, maybe I should have been here to uh, make people a bit more accountable, having an alcohol and another drug person. Um, no, but I wouldn't have done that. I probably would have drunk half of the wine myself. Um, I feel fairly humbled, humbled by this room full of people, I must say. I really wasn't expecting this to happen. I, I came here this morning and there was nobody on the sheet. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's okay. I've got my thing ready to go and, you know, that's okay. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen and I'll go and see Helen's session. And I thought everyone was going to be going to Helen's session, but um, it, it's quite humbling that you guys are here. But maybe you've been to a few of Helen's sessions over the past few days and you're ready for something different maybe. So I hope I can um, give you value for money in, in, in this um, next 45 minutes. I guess the, the format of it, I was really hoping to be able to, for us to have a, have a conversation um, and um, but I think what I need to do is I need to share some information with you beforehand about what I was talking about in my um, abstract about how this how this model of service delivery came about so I'll do that um, but we'd like to allow some time for I think about 15 minutes towards the end there and Julia's going to help me with that for us to have a conversation and some time for reflection and a bit of a discussion. But if it's okay with you, I'll sit down and hope the person's not going to take too many photos of me. Uh, yes, you can. <coughs> um, I'm going to re use my laptop here just for, for some notes that I've got here, so hopefully you, you won't mind me doing that. Um, now, Julia, would you be able to click on that, my name, and that'll bring up the PowerPoint presentation. <coughs> I've only just arrived today um, 
So I'm kind of hoping that this, uh, um, just just that first session with with Kelly and Helen um, was had a very human um, feel to it, and it um, was was really powerful. And, and I just I just I don't I hope this doesn't jar with any of the ongoing themes for the last three days for you guys because it's. There's a, there's a, it's a bit, um, you know, it's a bit of service delivery model stuff. So I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of share some information with you that's probably a bit harder, harder information than some of the narrative conversation stuff. But hopefully we can, we can soften it up towards the end there. Um, so Julie has introduced me. You guys know where I'm from, um, and I've come up this morning. What I'd like to do is just talk about the, the service integration program and how the model of service delivery has evolved, how the, how the model works. Oh. How did that happen? Oh, okay. Oh, did you do that? There you go. Did you do that? Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> I just thought this thing's doing it itself. Thanks, Julia. I'll take it from here. Okay, not a problem. <laughs> I'll just sit here and Control. Shut up. <laughs> I need control. Um, okay, I'll hit this key here, Julia. So it's about how the model works. It's not necessarily about how well it works. But it may come across that it works well. I, I might have a bit of an inclination to make it sound that way, but it's, that's not really what this is about so much. So it's about how the model works and its key components, and it's really just for you guys to think about and, and think about where it sits with your role and your lives, I guess, and, and whether it has any merit for you to go on with. Um, this. It's about a response that we created at, at, at Anglicare to a set of issues and needs which were identified within Anglicare programs. Um, and I guess it's a model that's worth thinking about in the context of working with people who have, um, I don't believe I'm about to say this, but multiple morbidities. <laughs> Has everybody heard that term? I just heard it the other day and it actually explains what we're talking about. So people have a whole lot of issues, health issues, um, a range of issues existing at the same time. People talk about comorbidity, coexisting issues. This is about this is about looking at people who have a range a range of issues, sorry about that. Um, including alcohol and other drugs. So just what's on the menu, not that you guys probably need to talk about food anymore, I'm in the third day of a conference. Um, so I'm just going to describe to you the, the, about some research that was done at, within Anglicare. I'll, sh I'll share a bit about the model itself and I'll share a uh, story, a case study with you guys and then um, a little bit of stakeholder feedback, just to try and paint the picture for you all. Um, and hopefully that will help us to have some reflection time later on. That's just a little bit about my background. I think Julia's said, um, did you say 15 years? I don't know why I seem to dwell on that. I'm not counting, am I? <laughs> <laughs> so I've done a few different things. Um, and that those experiences certainly helped me in this current role. I guess I was thinking about this, the, the title of this um, presentation, Transformation Through I Integration, and I was thinking maybe it should have a question mark at the end of it, really. Um, the question is, is it transformation? through integration. I'm, I'm curious about what transformation uh, means for you guys. I'm curious about what integration means for you guys and what that, what that language means for you guys. Um, 
and you know I'm happy if you guys want to just put your hand up and jump up and say well actually I've got this this is how I feel about the word integration or the word transformation if you want to do that please just if you've got the volition to do that go for it does anybody want to say anything at this stage about any of those any of that language so just some things to think about as we go through this also some things f f that I'm reflecting on as we were um, as I was preparing okay does this presentation does this service talk about practice does it talk about service system tr community transformation reform and I, and I think it does um, but maybe I you should be the judge of that after we've I've actually gone through this with you um, I think it actually ties through quite a lot of these these themes so what does integration mean for you guys what does the term mean for you guys does anybody want to have a go at some sort of definition I think there's a whole lot of different meanings for the word integration it's okay if you don't I can just keep bowling along yeah I guess it's about down to yeah yeah sure yeah okay so, yeah so breaking down the silos between services that are siloed and separate yeah anybody else John Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Did everyone hear that? Yep. Anybody else there? Yep. Thank you. Does everyone hear that? That it's about somebody who's using services, they are able to integrate so that they can uh, get the best out of the services that are available. So it's integration from a service user's perspective. Is it, does that sound about right? Yeah. Does that reflect? Yeah. I guess I just had a bit of a go at it, and this is my own definition of what integration is, is just bringing together bring together um, the bringing together of AO developed resources with, with the resources within the mental health and housing and homelessness streams at Anglicare so that's specifically what this is about it's not it's not right across the community it has benefits right across the community but it's focused within Anglicare to meet to meet clients needs and so hopefully that um, is as apparent to anyone um, for service users as it is for anyone else so just to talk about the uh, the SIP story um, and where it evolved. I'll just keep persevering. This thing must be bat batteries or something. But um, there was a research... Okay, well, that's working for now. I'll, do, I'll stand over there. If, that, if this one doesn't work, I'll just stand over there. Um, there was a research paper done at Anglicare and it was called Just Another Manic Monday. Can anybody tell me where, who, who sung that song? Who? Bangles, when? Yep, 85. And what was it about? Having a good week. 
Yeah, and wishing. Yeah, and because on Monday everyone wants you to be everyone they want them to be, and they want you to be in lots of different places at the one time, and you just wish it was Sunday. So I think that's why it was chosen, um, and it was done with action research um, pro program at what's that? <laughs> Did you only hear bits of that? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I didn't plan for this, but that's okay because we've got a professional. Yes, this is testing my resilience. Okay. Now this one's not working. Is that working? Okay, it's just, just a little bit softer. How does that sound? All righty. Teresa Hinton, uh, she's the person that did this paper. She did it in 2008. Um, and the, the, the research, um, just quickly, it, the paper, it's a, it's a proper research paper, um, although as part of the social action research, it's, it's, it's a paper that's meant to be put into action. So it's not just for a, the body of knowledge, it's for, it's for action. And so these are some of the themes that informed the design of the SIP model, which is why it might be relevant to you guys. It's available on the Anglicare website if you want to read the whole 80 pages of it. And so it, just another Mathing Monday, it's called The Challenge of Working with Clients with Alcohol and Other Drug Issues in Community Service Organisations. The research quantifies the extent to which workers in Tasmanian community service organisations, or CSOs, outside the specialist ATOD sector, alcohol, tobacco and other drugs, work with clients who have substance use issues by profiling one of the CSOs. Sorry, that's a little typo there. Anglicare Tasmania. So even though these... Ex issues exist across the community, we looked at it mainly internally. Because Anglicare in Tasmania, we've got a lot of programs and a lot of programs where these issues were occurring. So it was about looking at um, uh, what's happening and, and how we can actually come up with a response. I guess a couple of significant things that actually came out of the, the um, research for me that kind of significant things that jumped out were it, the research found that almost half of the client contacts in a two week period at Anglicare, um, workers were dealing with problematic alcohol and drug issues which impacted negatively on the service which they could provide and on the outcomes for the clients. And half of this population um, either did not identify that they had a problem or if they did were not ready to begin to tackle it. So that's pretty significant. Um, so from the paper there were 16 recommendations that came from the research whole range of things were looked at including the the issues and the barriers and the opportunities um, and the, as I said before the focus was internally right across a whole lot of programs ranging ranging from mental health housing and homelessness disability counseling and family support and employment the way that it was done just quickly um, interviews was mainly interviews um, with service users, staff and stakeholders. They also did a survey um, and they utilised a, a whole lot of other data um, and findings from, from other sources as well to, inf to inform the, the research. They referenced a whole lot of alcohol, tobacco and other drug frameworks including federal and state legislative frameworks service networks from the DHHS through to the community service organisations and 
and so on and so forth. Um, and you know, they've produced a lot of numbers um, regarding um, this set of issues and, and the people that were being impacted and, and the services that were being, the service workers that were being impacted. So there was a lot of a lot of information in there. I won't go too far into it. One thing that they looked at was um, how the support was currently being provided to the clients within those programs. This is before SIP, the service integration program. So, so it's about building the relationship. This is workers in mental health programs, workers in housing, lists, housing programs and a range of different programs. So if they were working with somebody who had a, an AOD issue, then this is what they would be doing to try to respond. And it worked and it didn't work. And it's about building a relationship, trying to pr promote the motivation for the person to change in regards to their AOD use. It was about harm minimisation and getting the people into detox or specialist, other specialist services. And it also looked, um, they also spoke about a lot of the restrictions and barriers to these interventions and to achieving these outcomes. I just wanted to, oh there we go, I've just given you a bit of a, bit of a tip. What, what, what do you think the restrictions and barriers might be for, for workers who are working with people who have AOD issues and they don't have a lot of resources for responding that person because they're in a mental health program or they're in a housing and homelessness program. What, do you, what are some of the barriers and restrictions that might occur for these people? Okay. Yep. Okay, that's a big barrier, isn't it? Yeah, having to tell the story over and over again, yep. Sure, yep. Thank you, not enough time. Any others? Yeah, so high case loads, not enough capacity, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, so restrictions from policy framework and being held back there. Yep, Chris. Yep. Yeah. Great. So restricted skill sets and, and the training background and people not feeling that they've got the right training to, to respond. Yep, so that's pretty much bingo for you guys. There was a few others that you, you added in there, so and I think I think that telling the story over and over again is a really significant one as well. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll get on to talking about the SIP model later. Um, how am I going for time, Julia? Okay, so I'll keep moving along. Um, it looked at how we could improve the responses and the role of workers and the training and specialist staff. So it looked at trying to remove those barriers by building capacity building the skills of the workers and enabling the workers, giving, virtually giving permission to the workers to, to actually respond and overcome a lot of those restraints. And also workers said that they'd, they'd like to be able to refer to a specialist support within Anglicare, which is me. So this is where the seeds were sown um, for the SIP program. Now we move on to the beginning, the early days, and uh, th this is a, the early pioneers. And, and I've got a photo of my coordinator, Christopher Chalmers, up there uh, in, in his uniform um, when he first started, and he gave me consent to provide this photo. But not long after, he was engaging with workers and clients he was suggested he could tone down his dress sense just to be a little bit more collaborative 
So they, uh, Chris, Chris was the. Um, this program started three years ago, and Chris was there from the start. Okay, now they explored everyone's needs and all sorts of ideas around what what's going to work, what what should we do um, to respond to some of these needs that are happening around the AO, AOD for clients, um, and so it was a very collaborative ground up process working from the ground up and the seeds were starting to germinate so it was very very much a, a, a ground up process and, and not one that was imposed from a from a policy uh, a a design that was imposed on the people if you like so that was pretty cool um, the key components are re referral pathways, collaborative approach to working with clients, all of those things that we all aspire to um, in, in our work and, and keeping it really flexible and having a specialist set of skills in providing the responses. Um, so the actual service delivery model, we do assessment, referral, key part of it is the brief intervention and the stages of change, working with the stages of change excuse me, getting a sense of where the people are at in terms of their AOD use and whether they want to change or not. And it's about applying the, the, uh, the, the appropriate brief intervention at the right time. So if people are pre-contemplative, it's about doing things a certain way and using the power of the relationship to have a conversation about the, the pros and cons of their alcohol and drug use and then moving into a motivational and interviewing conversation and doing other other methods of counselling and ad advocacy. Doing outreach, so home visits, working on home reduction and the key other key part of um, the model is capacity building within the organisation. So it's half working with clients I've got a caseload of um, about 20 and it's also a case of providing, um, sorry I've got my, my shoulder to you guys, um, it's about um, doing what we call capacity building exercise so work workforce development is another bit of jargon but providing training and um, c consultation and support for the workers to build up their skills in regards to AOD, but that's all really flexible. It's about what the workers want, given the work that they're trying to do. Any questions before I just go on to the case study? So this is a story about Stephen, um, his journey with Anglicare services. He was referred by a worker at one of our lodges at Anglicare and it was as a, as a consequence of Stephen saying that he would like some help with his alcohol use and his issues with social isolation and depression. 51 years of age and single and working part time as a volunteer. Prior to staying at the lodge, he was he didn't have stable accommodation. He was referred by a housing program into the lodge. And it, that was only meant to be a temporary thing, but he got bogged down and got, got quite um, a fair, fair bit of depression and, and despair. Um, it became clear that his social isolation was the <laughs> impacting on his health and well-being, and he was finding it difficult to come up with the energy and the motivation to change his circumstances. We discussed a range of th things. Um, recognising that alcohol was getting in the way from the feelings of depression that he was living with day to day. So he was using the depression to overcome the, p the pain, I guess, of, of the, the isolation and the, and the level of despair, I think. And he was more interested in talking about um, the meaning and, and purpose in his life rather than talking about alcohol, his alcohol use. So we didn't... Uh, uh, we we didn't talk about alcohol all that much, interestingly enough, uh, interestingly enough. Um, because for him, 
drinking was just the tip of the iceberg and it was much bigger and deeper than that. Sorry about all the words up here, guys. I'll just get through this. Um, we did discuss, we did discuss, however, um, his use of alcohol and how he might be able to reduce that so it, it might impact differently on his health and, and, and also his mental health and he was happy to go away and give, give things a try. Um, st he st Stephen stated that he needed to do more, build up his social supports and friendship groups and some of those natural supports because they were pretty much non-existent as a consequence of him withdrawing. Um, and we had, a, we had a chat about the idea of a fam's worker and, and Stephen was very happy for that to happen. Stephen's not his real name, by the way. Sorry, I should have said that earlier on. Um, <coughs> Stephen was struggling with the emptiness and the lack of interest in things. And Stephen also mentioned that he was experiencing a level of suicidality and that he had tried before um, and that he still felt a level of risk. So we spoke about that and, and I think that was a really significant moment in, in our, our working together because he wasn't actually naming it up and, and I thought I was hearing him saying that he was um, feeling suicidal and, and so I sort of um, pushed him a bit harder, and, well, not pushed him harder but I, sp I, I inquired a bit more and, and I think there was a sense of relief for, for Stephen uh, at that point and it was, that was a key part of our relationship because he knew that he was... Um, he knew that I knew. We also developed a plan for him to go to his GP and just have a look into a mental health plan and, and possibly medication. Okay. So we explored some more goals around housing. Stephen wanted to move out and live independently and live closer to his family and friends. Um, and he stated... He stated in a, re a recent meeting that he things were heading in the right direction and, and he's hooked up with his fam's worker and he's been to Housing Connect and things are, uh, things are heading in the right direction and so the brief intervention that I was able to provide, including the, the conversation around the mental health issues and the suicidality, put his feet back on the ground and he had a different level of energy. And um, I've since heard that he's got himself a place and he's uh, living independently and, and that, that's actually all I know. I don't, I'm not suggesting that's, um, you know, that's everything, all the problems solved. I'm, he's got a number of challenges ahead. Um, so I, I guess I just wondered what the themes were coming through, but maybe we'll get back to that a little bit later because we'll keep bowling along, I think. What's that? For the total? Okay. This is just a bit of stakeholder feedback from um, service, other service providers. Now, I was sitting back thinking last night when I was in my hotel room doing this, why haven't we got any... We don't have any feedback for this presentation from service users um, and we, one of our primary commitments I think at, at Anglicare like a lot of places is, is about getting um, feedback from people that use the services but that didn't actually help tell the story in this case for how the model works. It probably more told the story of how well it works and there was lots of appreciation for the support that they were receiving so it didn't quite seem to hit the mark and and you know I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear feedback if people think that was oh, I probably should have included that so th this uh, we had a there's a bit of feedback here and I'm not going to just go through it all it paints the picture some of it's um, fairly standard I guess but it's timeliness and flexibility was what's appreciated and down the bottom there does this thing have a light on it I wonder no great innovation can see how it works 
can see how the similar models would benefit all Anglicare services and, th and that idea of cross-pollination is absolutely vital to what we do. Um, the one-to-one -one short term support so people can refer to the, the SIP worker and I can I can just spend time working with them on a whole range of different things from an AOD perspective so it's sort of like a you know putting yourself into a special space for the client for the person using the service um, there are limits on the intervention because of the fact that there's only one of me, there's only one person in the south and one person in the north, so that's it gets pretty stretched, which is not uncommon in the community sector. Okay, now you might be wondering why there's a little pussycat up there. I, I googled, I tried to google an image for chat and ended up with cat, a whole lot of cats. So you've got a little, little pussy cat up there. But baby, I'm just going to ask you um, to have a bit of a leg stretch or just take a little minute, maybe maybe just a couple of minutes, given that we've only got how many left, Julia? Nine minutes. Um, just to think about these questions. What are the possibilities for what I do and it could hopefully these questions are relevant to anyone in this room so just take just take a couple of minutes just by yourself or you can go outside or um, by um, or to the person with the person next to you so just two minutes we'll come back So guys, we might come back. Um, not sure if the guys are having a bit of fresh air out there. Hey Richard, would you be able to give those guys a bit of a holler? We're on. Thanks Richard. So I wonder if you might if you'd like to um, just share with me uh, just some of your thoughts, I guess, in regards to any of those questions. Or you may have some other questions or some other reflections. We can keep it pretty flexible. Richard.
Absolutely. And the, and the tricky thing is if you're working with somebody to be able to um, provide that level of, to have that conversation with them to, to address the AOD issues and to support them to a stage where they can say that they might like to look into it a bit more. And it's that that's one of the key parts of it. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, can everyone hear? No. Shall we try that other microphone? We might just try the other mic. Sorry. Unless you want to really try and go for it. <laughs> go for it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So different people, different workers. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So that, and that's something that you're putting out into the room for people to reflect on, to, for people to be, to be mindful of that, yeah? Because it, there was the first part about your, what you were saying with about the confidentiality and the sharing of information. Yeah, and that's, that's super tight in terms of how that's done. And the, the, the person has to give consent, obviously, to provide the initial information to do the referral. And then, then the whole uh, there's a separate conversation about privacy and consent once the person sits down with this this SIP worker, me, and we go through all that just so just to make sure that it's you're in control of it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Ah, uh, sure. No. Okay. Yeah, it is. And I always say to people, you don't have to. No, it, yeah. Yeah. Mm, okay. That doesn't sound quite right, does it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. (coughs) 
Yeah, it is. It's the primary thing. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And it's got to be it's got to be flexible. It's got to be flexible. One more question. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's important for us to hear that stuff. I really appreciate you sharing that with us and everyone else as well. Sorry, Chris, we're not going to have time for you. I have to talk to you at lunchtime. And, uh, it, uh, I'm sorry that we have um, to wrap it up, um, but I'll be here all day and and because there's one question that was put here before who can refer to this program and it's it's really only it's only for anglicare clients people that are using anglicare services and but it's flexible right if, if you know if one of you guys rang up and said i need to see an, an aod counsellor then you'd probably get put through to me and we'd do a self-referral and we'd go from there but I didn't just say that <laughs> um, so I'm going to say um, thank you and thank you very much thanks guys Even with all the IT issues and the hot room, and <laughs> it was a very informative session. So thank you very much, Guy. Um, even from the questions that were generated and the conversations, people were ob obviously very interested in the program. So yes, Guy will be here during the lunchtime and this afternoon. So if you have any more questions, just tackle him to the ground and keep him there. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very much. We'll just have a two minute break whilst we set up because we have another guest speaker and um, we'll try and fix the air conditioning and all that as well. So two minutes please.
You ready, Gatti? You ready? If I can get this off. Do you want to turn that one off? <laughs>